Thank you. Um, I'm very uh, happy to be here. Um, since uh, years ago at the Paigrun Conference of 2014, um, I was in this very room, in fact, uh, for a talk by uh, Kenneth Wrights on his requests uh, library, which is um, basically uh, the, the focus of that talk was um, uh, making a clear API um, which can cover 80% of use cases in 20% of the time for your users. Um, and I remember thinking at that time that uh, for my work as a theoretical physicist, uh, at that time a chemist actually, um, that such a tool didn't exist yet in the, in the Python world for me, that I could uh, easily um, uh, like do my fitting uh, software, that, uh, fitting problems that way. Um, so back then it started, and uh, that hobby has completely escalated uh, to this talk today. Um, so what is my essential problem? Um, oftentimes I have uh, data that I want to fit to, and I have the equations, and some uh, problems are easily expressed in mathematical equations, but can result in very complicated looking code. So for example, uh, if I have a problem such as this one, um, it's relatively easy to write down what my model is, and uh, I have I want to maximize this subject to constraints. Um, that's easy enough to write down, but if I now want to tell the computer um, to give me the value of x and y, um, that will uh, involve quite a lot of coding, um, even though symbolically it's easy to write down. Um, and the problem is I'm not an expert on numerical optimization. I'm a physicist, I just want to know x and y so I can continue with my life and my problems. Um, so this, uh, leads me to the problem that there are many optimizers out there, and when I start Googling, you end up with all these different libraries, and which one is the right one uh, for me? How do I decide? Um, another problem that I could have is that uh, the optimizer I select um, might want to uh, have the Jacobian or the Hessian of the problem. If you don't know those terms, it doesn't matter. Um, and that's uh, redundant information because once I know the equation, I know what all the derivatives are. I can just calculate the derivative of x and um, I don't want to have to code that explicitly. It's all in the model anyway. So those are these things, like these derivatives and second derivatives are already encoded in the original problem. So I don't want to have to type that again. Um, additionally, if I have to take these derivatives by hand or uh, copy them from some other program, um, it's easy to make mistakes, and it also results in bulky code. So what I would like to have is a tool that will just uh, take care of the translation from mathematics to um, uh, the programming code um, that will allow me to continue with my research. So part of the solution, a big part, comes from SymPy, which is a nice symbolical library that we have in Python which is basically similar to uh, Mathematica uh, in Python. So I will just um, be able to write my original equation in a symbolic fashion, and using SymPy, um, I can just ask it, give me the derivative of f with respect to x, and it will give me the right value, or the second derivative of f with respect to y and then x, and there's no problem, it just comes rolling out. So that's very nice. But now I need to put this into uh, numerical um, optimizer like SciPy. So luckily SymPy again comes to the rescue because it offers great code printing facilities. So again, take this function here. I can just tell SymPy to lambdafy it. I call this function lambdafy on f with x and y as arguments. And what that will print for me is the Pythonic equivalent of the same uh, equation. So that's a good step in the right direction. Um, the second part of the solution would be to plug that equation that we just got into uh, SciPy or any other library for optimization. Um, so SciPy is really a powerhouse of numerical uh, optimization, um, and it has many different optimizers, such as gradient-based ones, uh, heuristics, ones that support constraints problems, um, global minimizers, if I have multiple local uh, minima, um, However, it has a different API. It doesn't speak to SymPy. 
And that is where this hobby project of mine uh, came in and escalated completely. <laughs> um, so in SimFit, what we would do is simply write down um, the original model equation. And now without the constraints in place, if I want to maximize this function, I will simply say fit minus this model in order to maximize it because we always minimize nor normally um, and execute the fit and that will immediately give me the result. So it will tell me, uh, if you look in this corner here, the values of x and y. But more importantly, um, the minimizer it chose to use was a gradient-based one and uh, we minimized the model itself and that without me specifying it, uh, because uh, the fit was just able to infer that from the problem statement. So upping the difficulty level, uh, level a little bit, if I now start from the same model, but I add these constraints to the problem, so x cubed minus y equals one, and y minus one greater or equal to zero, it, um, adding the constraints is now a simple matter of saying fit minus the model to maximize with these constraints. And if I then uh, execute the fit, we see that I find different values. Now apparently the right answer is one comma one. But more importantly, um, we now decided to use the SLSQP minimizer from SciPy, which um, supports constraints without us having to tell, uh, tell it to do that. So now let's start uh, adding some data to these problems. Um, suppose I was confronted with a data set, uh, y1 plus or minus a standard deviation, sigma i, and I want to fit a linear model to that, uh, fi equals ax plus b. And so we want to find a b such that uh, we fit that data, right? This is a classical uh, linear regression. Um, so the standard trick would be to minimize the chi-squared function, which is defined in this way. So in SimFit, what you would end up doing then is we define our linear model here, and then it becomes just a matter of saying to the fit object, uh, this is the model, x data and y data. The standard deviations I can fit in with this argument here, uh, sigma y um, is the standard deviation in y, and we execute the fit. And what we will then see happening is in these results, um, automatically the fit has decided that since you provided data, you probably want to use a least squares fit. So again, we didn't have to say that. Um, and we just use a least squares and it will give us the right result for my trial data here. So really at the root of this um, uh, package is this fit object and the fit only has uh, a couple of arguments that you need to know about. So you can provide it with a model, which can be um, a normal analytical model. It can be an ODE model, so really a system of ODEs with some parameters in them that we want to extract. Um, or it can be a normal numerical model. Um, and you usually end up providing it with some data and optionally constraints. And from that, in principle, the fit object will um, make all the decisions for you. But if I really want to uh, tell it, like no, you should do a log likelihood, for example, log likelihood fit, then as the objective, you can explicitly provide that to give it a hint on what to do. Um, the same goes for the minimizer. You can explicitly tell it which minimizer you want. Okay, so that concludes this section, and now I will uh, break one of the rules of presenting code, which is live coding. <laughs> Um, so let's hope this all pans out. Nope. <laughs> okay, that way it works. Okay, so um, is this visible from the back, by the way? Yeah, okay, perfect. So um, let's skip the uh, unimportant stuff. So what we have here is suppose I have a model which looks like this kind of um, Mexican hat potential where I have uh, one global minimum and one local minimum. So we might be familiar with that if I want to fit this and I don't provide the right initial guesses to force the algorithm towards this one, uh, it might end up stuck there. So let's see what happens in the next cell. I will first uh, do the analytical solving using SimPy because um, I have here the um, model's equation so I can just solve it analytically since 
we have both uh, in-house here. Um, and now let me perform in this cell here uh, the fit to this model without providing any initial guesses or any better intuitions. And what we see ending, uh, what, what ends up happening is that indeed we end up in this positive value, right? Which is not the global one. We end up in this local minimum here. So one, if we now want to find the uh, global minimum, what is now very easy to do in this infrastructure is we tell uh, FIT that as a minimizer, it should use a differential evolution instead, which is a global minimization and which will scan the whole space. And that's now as easy as just adding this one statement. And then we immediately end up in the right um, potential well. Uh, but what you also see is that the exact value and the numerical value uh, deviate at the, what, at the third decimal there. And that's because the differential evolution is quite crude. So you could force the, uh, the crude algorithm to um, work harder, but this is a very expensive um, algorithm. So what we can actually do in this API is just tell it um, to first do a global step and then smoothen it off with a, a local minimizer again so that it really precisely um, goes to the bottom of this well there. And then if you run it, uh, you see that we exactly basically exactly to very high order get the right result. And that's all in a, like one statement of work. Um, upping the ante a little bit. Uh, this is taken from a Stack Overflow question um, that somebody posted where this became the accepted answer. So um, this person had the following data set where they wanted to model a straight line to the initial part here and an exponential decay to the rest of the data set. And because we have the power of uh, SymPy at our exp expo uh, uh, disposal, we can um, actually define that model quite easily. So I define a part Y1, which is a linear curve, and Y2, which is an exponential decay. And from SymPy, you can just import the piecewise object so I can now tell it um, if t is smaller than t0, which is the uh, fit parameter, um, then use y1, the linear behavior. If you are larger than that parameter that we are going to be fitting here, um, use the other behavior, the decay. So if, so that, that's not the only thing we want. Um, if I just run this naively, the two parts might not join up nicely, right? So what if I add an extra constraint that I want the function to be continuous at this point T0 where we switch from one model to the other one? That's now as easy as just saying, okay, I have my function Y1, uh, the linear part, and I take that one at T0. I take the exponential decay at T0, and I demand equality between the two. So if I then just run this um, fit, we see that we get very nice continuity there and we get a nice uh, fit to the data. And just to show you um, the power of this uh, um, structure here, let's uh, make the constraints even more difficult. Let's not only demand continuity between the two, but also that the function be differentiable. So that means I want the first derivatives to be the same. Because we're working symbolically, I can just say um, take y1, differentiate it, and substitute it to t0. So this is really the differential of the linear part, and take that to be equal to the uh, derivative of the exponential part. And then if I run the fit again, what happens? Um, then I get this fit here. As a fit, it's not uh, great. But uh, what I want you to appreciate is uh, how little effort was it required to uh, make sure that it connects continuously here, right? It, like by I, I cannot um, tell the difference there. Um, going to the fit results here, we actually also see that this constraint was met to a degree of 10 to the minus 14th and that to the 10 to the 11th, so it's a good fit. All right, that concludes the simple examples. Okay, 
now, um, where are we in time? Ten minutes? Okay. So now let me just show you two uh, real-world examples that we solved and published, uh, where we also use this library. Um, there's going to be mathematics ahead. Um, again, uh, probably you already figured this out, but the goal is not to understand, follow the mathematics per se of what I'm doing, but uh, to focus on the API. Um, so I'm going to talk about some ordinary differential equation solving with parameters in it that need to be fitted and doing an inverse Laplace transform very crudely. Um, so for the differential equations, simple model, don't focus on the chemistry too much, but we're cross-linking rubbers. So the backbone of rubber is, is this long polymer chain, polymer chain. And it has these molecules, uh, these red molecules here, which we will call F. Um, and they can be thought of as kind of points where you can attach. And then these blue molecules here, called MM, are the bridges. And the idea here would be to connect these polymer chains together with these cross-linking molecules to create the state here on the right where the rubber is fully cross-linked. Uh, the benefit being that that makes a better tire than the other one for better mechanical property. So we have these two differential equations where I first take uh, one of the bridges and I attach it to the polymer backbone once and then hopefully it will attach again on the other side to form the completed bridge. So these are the systems, uh, like the chemical equations, and that results in this system of ODEs, which is not very pleasant uh, to look at, perhaps. Um, we have multiple parameters here that can be fitted, but um, just as an important note, uh, there is no closed solution for this as well, so we need to integrate this numerically. Oh, sorry, so this means that we go to another notebook. Um, so, first off this slide, um, here I built the same model, the same system of equations in Python. But, okay, it's, it's definitely not the prettiest to look at, but I hope you appreciate it. It, it, it does look just as bad as the previous mathematical equation we had. Uh, not a lot worse. Um, additionally, um, I now have to tell SimFit, okay, this is going to be an ODE model. Um, so we have to provide initial guesses. So we say that at T0, um, we have a molecule uh, of a, a concentration MM0 and the initial concentration for the other species. Um, and then if I generate some mock data, I end up with this mock data here. So I just uh, generated some points, added some noise, and this is the mock data that I'm going to try to fit again. Um, so what you see is that throughout the, uh, oops, I get some feedback. Um, you see that throughout the reaction, we go from uh, a high concentration of F and that uh, disappears, right? The other species, the, the bridging molecule also disappears and we get a rise of the product, the green curve, and also a stationary amount, roughly speaking, of the intermediary species. Um, so hmm, I shouldn't be stepping on these cables too much. So now let's fit to that, to that mock data. So this is the line to focus on. I have uh, a t-axis and uh, I have data for the species MM and for F. And let's now say that for experimental reasons, I'm only able to measure those two beginning compounds, the, the uh, cross-linker and the rubber chains, but I'm not able to measure the final product on the intermediary. If that is the case, I can just tell SimFit that I have no data for that one, none, and for the other one, none. Uh, and just ha have at it. Um, additionally, I will bound the initial guesses for these parameters, but that's um, minor detail. That's just to help the, the fit along uh, a bit. So then if we execute that fit and I plot the results, I get the following. So even though I provided only data for the blue curve and for the red curve, you see that we are still getting a good fit for the other two species as well. Um, and we are, were able to extract our K parameters, which uh, correspond physically to rate coefficients for these reactions. 
in very few lines of code, I think. So, well, on the outside. <laughs> okay, and that brings me to my final uh, slides, which is uh, a problem that we solved uh, for doing inverse uh, Laplace transforms. Um, this is in my current research in uh, uh, Lattice QCD. Um, so there we had to do a thicken of regularization, which is also commonly used in um, uh, machine learning uh, related fields. Um, I will not go into the derivation of what we had to do here, but let's say I was confronted with a data set uh, of uh, SI versus F, and this capital F represents the uh, Laplace transform of the thing I actually want to know. So I don't really care about F, I need to do the inverse Laplace. Um, our strategy for doing that is I define this matrix M here, which is uh, one over uh, SI plus SJ. I work with this quantity D, which is the norm of all the noise in our data. And then, we're almost there, we define this matrix W, which is defined as identity plus uh, M over alpha squared inverse. And then what I have to solve is um, our fitting problem is I have to find alpha squared, which is the fitting parameter, the only fitting parameter. Uh, find alpha squared such that um, the norm of the noise is equal to the norm of C, where C is this matrix, uh, uh, sorry, this factor quantity here, where uh, W was this matrix and F is a factor of our uh, original data there. So what ends up happening if we want to do this fit? So this is, again, for reference, the system of equations. Um, in Python code now, all I have to write is the following. Um, w is the inverse of that object, C is this, and D is the norm of that matrix quantity. And so it's basically the same as what I would write mathematically. And again, I can just say fit that with uh, D, the norm of the uh, noise, and I have to provide these matrix and factor quantities respectively, um, where, where I just have to change that these uh, things are now matrix quantities instead of numbers. And that is it. So um, just very briefly toward the conclusions, if you need more advanced control, you can definitely do that. You are able to um, um, define all these objects for your own uh, need to, to make changes as long as you respect uh, certain rules. Uh, and that brings us to the conclusions. Um, so what we wanted to do with this project is uh, to stay as close as possible uh, to the mathematics that you would write on paper. Um, with SymPy, we can already do that, but it doesn't speak to our fitting uh, tools, like SciPy Optimize. So SciPy is really good at crunching numbers, but not good at uh, symbolical work. Um, and we tied these things together uh, which allowed us to do what we're good at, which is interpreting the data and continuing our research. So with that, just one final word. Um, some of the features I just showed you are in the master branch right now, but not yet in the released version. So SimFit 0.5.0 uh, should be coming to a package manager near you soon. And uh, thank you for your attention. And before we go to the questions, by the way, like because I was a bit nervous starting off, uh, I forgot to mention that my other collaborator, Peter, is also here. <laughs> His name was on the first slide, but bec I, was, uh, I jumped the gun there. So. Questions from the audience? Well, I have a first question. Uh, which brand of tire should I get? Which what? Are oh, the, the tires, yeah. Um, well, these particular tires actually don't work yet because the problem here is that these equations are, uh, are equilibriums and uh, once the tires would get too hot, uh, the stuff would reverse and the uh, tire would fall apart. So actually these tires, definitely not. Ah, very much work <laughs> in progress. For now. Uh, you showed this uh, example where you had this uh, piecewise uh, function. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just wondering, um, of course, there's no defined uh, derivative at this point unless you put this constraint. Mm -hmm. So how does your algorithm uh, figure out what to do at this point? Uh, ordinarily, without the constraint, you mean, or with the constraint? 
uh, without constraints. So it, it could be uh, that there's no derivative at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, um, well, if there's m maybe if there's not even a derivative and also not uh, the demand that it's continuous, it will just uh, fit both sides of the data separately. Okay. And you will just get a discontinuity at that point. And then with that one constraint, you can force it to at least be continuous, and then you can also force it to, be uh, to have a derivative. Okay. So that's basically, like, it, it, will, it will still give a, well, if you give uh, the right initial guesses, you will still get a result also without uh, those things. But there's of course always a bit of a uh, finger spitting gefühl involved uh, to get it to, to massage it a bit in the right direction. Okay, okay thanks. Yeah. Yeah, you also got me wondering what's happening under the hood, but I guess it's homework to look at yeah. the source code, how <laughs> this magic actually happens. Uh, other questions? Might be a bit of a stupid question, but um, so looking at your output, I was wondering: um, is it difficult to decide like what to put in the output? Because I can, uh, if I look at uh, people that make R packages, for, for example, mm -hmm. um, they use kind of the same uh, nomenclature, like intersect, p-values, and stuff, but mm -hmm. they mean completely different. Mm -hmm. uh, you will have. Uh, your um, uh, your models basically have a certain set of output, but like, do you mm -hmm. have to put a lot of consideration into like how you display your output so people that would use it would mm -hmm. understand it in the right way? Or is this like? Yeah. Uh, well, that would be the ideal case, I guess, that everybody is able to understand. So you're talking about the fit results, right? That yeah, I showed yeah. that. Yeah. So uh, uh, indeed, there's some ambiguity there because also uh, in different fields, people do use different notations for things. But for sure, the goal is to stay close to the, the standard statistic nomenclature. Um, but yeah, there can sometimes be some Im ambiguity there. Uh, but, but definitely, if there's a good reference or something like this is what it's supposed to be called, then we will try to follow that, of course. And do you get a lot of feedback? I mean, do you have um, It's starting to pick up now. Uh, like, uh, I think more people are starting to use it now at the moment, so now there's finally uh, some issues coming in, which is good, but also more work for me, of course, but uh, for, uh, for us. But there's finally feedback coming back, so yeah. It's time for one more question. Don't be too impressed by the mathematics. Yeah. <laughs> If no one else will take the question, what <laughs> feature do you want added most? Ooh. What's the next step? Uh, yeah, so I am already obsessed with one at the moment, uh, which would be um, currently you have to use, um, uh, if you want to add constraints to your uh, optimization problem, um, you have to use the right optimizer for that, or minimizer for that. Uh, but I would like to implement it uh, such that we will always add these Lagrange multipliers to everything, which is the technical term, so that you can add constraints to any model. That would be my dream for the next step. But there's also, like, yeah, there's plenty of new features coming up, I think, uh, in terms of different optimization functions. Uh, so. Pull requests are there. welcome, I guess. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> pull requests are very welcome. Okay, one more hand for Peter and Martin.